What's up, humans? Thanks for joining us for another episode of Shots from the Winchester podcast brought to you by Greencastle Consulting, your nation's premier strategy execution firm. I'm Al Green and Del Roll, and we're going to jump into a conversation with the amazing Jeff Clark. Jeff is perfect for shots from the Winchester because, you know, he's a veteran um, and he's doing amazing things, um, not only as a writer, but in his day to day job. But what, you know, he's trying to get this is a special thing about Jeff. Jeff is got two feet in the publishing world and he's got a foot in the uh, nonfiction space and he's published in the nonfiction space. Uh, but then he's also dipping his toes into um, the, the fiction uh, space as well. So, you know, that's, that's no small thing. Um, you know, as I, I said before, uh, getting into this space is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done just because, you know, trying to figure out what is the standard and, you know, what uh, what do you have to do? And, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that anyone would want to do that probably puts you on the on the on on the spectrum for being, you know, insane. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, you know, it's a pleasure uh, to have Jeff on. Um, so we can uh, we let's let's get this. Uh, let's get this interview going, brother. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark is a veteran of the Air Force. OK, um, he is a veteran of the Air Force and he spent time as an operations officer, which, you know, is a different sort of thing than what I did. Um, but in any case, operations officer for the Air Force, but also did search and rescue as well. Um, since his active duty uh, career, he's transitioned to be a, uh, a government civil service employee, uh, continuing to support DOD and soldier sales. Sailors, airmen, and Marines, but also Guardians as well. Um, so we want we want to talk about your journey, Jeff. Tell us about yourself. But before we go any further, this is the book. Oh, um, that is Jeff's uh, Jeff's debut, and this I think is particularly special. And I hope we get a chance to talk a, a good deal about this. And this is um, this is about leadership. OK, um, that is a passion of just about everybody who's ever been in the service, uh, but also a passion for for our company as well. Um, and what I really like about this is it's nothing grandiose. It's it's based off of his actual experience. You know what works, what doesn't work. And what I love about this is there was a point in my life where I thought about writing a leadership book. And what I the more it came down was like, you know, it's really about putting your people and the mission ahead of yourself. And well, that's a greeting card. That's not a book. <laughs> and <laughs> and what, what Jeff just took it the extra mile. And there's some just beautiful stuff in here. So I'm going to stop talking because <laughs> okay. we came here to talk to Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your journey through the military. And then, you know, what are you doing afterwards? And then, and then we'll get into the books. Yeah, so uh, I joined the military in 2005. I was 21 years old. Um, I was working at Sears before Sears kind of folded as a company, um, selling lawn mowers and dishwashers and refrigerators, uh, plasma TVs. Remember when plasma TVs were all the rage wow. and they were thousands of dollars a piece? And yeah, uh, wow. yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So that's what I was doing, <laughs> and I was making decent money for me as a single guy. And uh, I was dating my wife, girlfriend at the time, and she said, man, if we want to make this something like you, you can't be working at Sears. Mm. And I had done two years of college and walked away with a year's worth of credits. I just didn't I wasn't in the right mind frame to do it, you know, <clears throat> and um, she said, you know, have you ever thought about joining the military? And I was like, nope. I wasn't like a super patriotic guy at the time. I mean, I was, but like it, it wasn't. It wasn't a top priority for me. It wasn't like that big of a deal. I wasn't interested in politics and all that stuff. And uh, she pointed me in that direction. It's the best best decision I ever made. Joined the Air Force. Didn't go to another recruiter. I liked what they said. Uh, my brother in law was in the Air Force. He was an A ten crew chief out at oh, uh, cool. Ve- out in Vegas, cool. out at Nellis. Nellis. So uh, uh, I rang him up and asked him a few questions, and he just told me, gave me some good advice, and and I did it, man. I just I jumped right in and. I uh, went into medical logistics at first, did did a lot of time, did two joint assignments uh, with the Army and with the Navy, uh, was stationed at Fort Sam Houston down in San Antonio at the Brooks Army Medical Center, 
uh, largest DOD level one trauma center. So that was a really eye eye opening. Um, and then I got injured a couple of times, um, in some, some training and some missions and therefore said, man, you're too broken. You got to get out of here. So they medically retired me 12 years wow. in. Yeah. It was a little devastating, but we kind of saw it coming. Um, fortunately for me, I'd done my match. So my master's and my bachelor's degree, I had a bunch of certifications. So I was forward, you know, leaning, there was a day where I was going to take the uniform off anyway. Um, so I got out, joined civil service, uh, was an operations officer. Uh, as a part of that, I was also a search and recovery officer and a mortuary officer. So uh, I've done okay. two search and recovery incidents. I've done four mortuary right. cases, which is if I could erase that from my career and never have had done it, uh, that would have been great because that would have meant there's four service members still alive today, um, which kind of still eats at me. You know, even to this day, having to work those kind of things, but you do what you got to do to take care of families and uh, you do yeah. do the honorable thing and lay them to rest how they would want it to be done in, in despite the circumstances. But yeah, I mean, I've been doing that for the last couple of years. Uh, just recently switched jobs. Now I'm a data data analyst uh, for manpower for flying training requirements. So I'm kind of on the uh, flying training operational side. We're pushing pilots out to the to the force and trying to keep the you know, the war going uh, when we need to take it to the enemy. That's cool. Wow. I, wow. I hate I hate to ask you this, but I think it's also intriguing and it's something that I think a lot of people are probably not overly aware of or familiar with. But, you know, you touched upon something uh, the mortuary affairs officer. Um, I can only imagine that that is going to be probably the worst job in the military. Um, yeah. Or quite, quite possibly um, just an actual gut punch. But at the same time, um, it's, it's also this beautiful opportunity to be there for a service member's family on their worst day. Um, is that something you feel comfortable talking about or? Yeah, you- sure. Yeah, we can. Yeah, so um, when I was the operations officer for the squadron, that was part of that was one of the hats I had to wear, and it was just one of those ones you hope you never have to wear. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, right after I took the job, we had uh, two suicides on base. We had an aircraft mishap, and we just we lost four members in a matter of like eight months. And um, low numbers considering the 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 issues that other bases have, but um, it was a pretty big whirlwind, and I think. The worst part about it is coming to grips with the fact that you've got to walk into a house after a family has been notified of maybe the most horrific and worst news of their entire life. And you have to say, hey, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. And nobody wants to hear that, just yeah. especially when it's when when it's a su- it's involved with a suicide. And a lot of people associate the fact that they committed suicide because they were in the service. And then you're like, hey, I'm from the service. I'm here to help you. And they just don't want to talk to you. They, yeah. I mean, it's just a bad day and yeah. you have to go in there and you can either be their best friend or the only punching bag in the room. And it depends on who's there. I walked into a house where it was 15 family members and I had to give the speech right in front of all of them. And in every single one of their eyes, they want to just put this to face. It's not my fault, but yeah. they're mad. They're upset. It's the, it's less than 72 hours after they've gotten this news and you got to go in there. And like I said, you're either their best friend or you're their biggest punching bag. And you just have to, you have to take the licks. And it was the, when people say, Oh, I have a thankless job. Like you don't know, you don't know what thankless feels like Mm -hmm. until you walk into a house ready to talk business with people who have just lost someone they love that they don't want to talk business about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's intense. Yeah. I bet that's gotta be, that's gotta be rough. Yeah. It's gotta be rough. Thank you you for uh, for that. No, absolutely. Thank you. That's a that's a different kind of service, and uh, it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, Well, let's move on to let's move on to something (laughs) more uplifting. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So you know, and and I think you can serve in in many regards as like a really inspirational uh, example for veterans because you know, regardless of why you join. You know, you you put on that uniform, you make that commitment for X amount of time, and you know maybe you're going to do 
four years. Maybe you're going to do 12. Maybe you're going to do 20. You know, at some point, it, it is going to come to an end. One way or another, it is going to come to an end. And then you're going to have to get on with the rest of your life. You're going to have to transition and move forward and find another why. Why am I getting up every morning? Why am I going out the door to do whatever it is you do? What, that life of service is a beautiful and special thing, but there's going to be a point of transition. Mm-hmm. So how did you, when you were coming out of the military, how did you um, choose to go down the path that you went down? And and as part of it, and maybe it's part of it, maybe it's like in tandem to it, is at what point did you de- decide, I want to be a writer? Mm-hmm. So um, I always kind of wanted to write a book, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a real creative kid, so uh, we didn't have like a ton of money. So I was often in my room playing with the limited amount of toys I had and then cutting other things out of cardboard boxes and duct tape and and stuff like that. So I was forced to go outside. I was always very creative. So I always had that kind of creative mindset. And I said, you know, once I got out of the military, I was going to do something creative. I just didn't know what. Mm-hmm. Um so I really when I got out, I didn't do a very good job of transitioning because I was so forward leaning my whole career that I was almost looking forward to getting out. And not that I wanted to, but I knew that day was coming. I was always constantly preparing, you know, educating myself. Hey, what is what does your resume look like? You know, what are the reading up on the new interview tips and things like that? And um, so when I got out, I said, I'm paying the bills first. So I went and sold beer. I just joined a local distribution company as a salesman, and I sold beer for six months until the right job in the civil service came open. And then I made the jump to them. Um, But I didn't really transition, guys, until like four years later when I had built a norm and I had built kind of a new career in the civil service. And I found I found my why as to why I'm doing what I'm doing in this next phase of my life, my next career. Um, and I started to write the book and I said, I'm going to get a leadership book done. And I had won a big award. I was the 2019 air force civilian supervisor of the year. Oh, wow. Um, and that's when, that's what it clicked. Thank you. And I said, I'm going to write a leadership book about all of this because I got a, I got to this moment, not because of me, because of so many other people, I got to put it in a, into something to share with more people. It's got to continue on like a domino effect. And um, that's when that's when some of my trouble transitioning started, because then I realized the injuries were catching up to me. Uh, What is anxiety and post-traumatic post-service stress and and frustrations and all that? I had ignored all that for so long because I was I was always forward leaning to when I slowed down because things were going good. I started having trouble. I started regressing and I. Fights with my wife, fights with the family, like it, nobody understood. I didn't understand, and it mm-hmm. finally took a friend of mine. Um, I was on a call like this with a, a retired Army Ranger, and he was like, "Dude, have you ever looked into PTSD or anxiety?" And I was like, "Nah, nah, I've never looked into none of that." He's like, "You need to. I got a VA guy you can call." And it took me a couple of weeks, but I swallowed my pride. I made that call, and then uh, it changed my life because. I got to meet with a doctor, somebody who knows what they're talking about and and put big things into perspective. And that's when I transitioned out of the military because I understood myself post uniform. Like we talk about, you know, transition all the time, taking off the uniform. No, Mm -hmm. you're not wearing combat boots every single day. You, I, the biggest decision you have to make when you wake up the day after service is what am I going to wear? Sounds yeah. ridiculous, but that's exactly mm-hmm. the that's your biggest decision. That yeah. that's the and it's your first decision because you wake up every morning, lace up the boots, put the uniform on, camouflage the same thing. That next day, when you don't have to do that, you what do I wear? <laughs> what the heck do I wear? You have to pay attention to the weather. Yeah, because <laughs> so you wear short sleeves. Like it's it's yeah. we don't we don't put that into perspective very well. And that's what I've been advocating for years is we do a horrible job as a military transitioning our members out because we just get them prepared for a job and for all these little things. We don't focus on the mental side of, hey, you, what are you going to wear tomorrow morning? Right. Nobody asks that. And that is so huge. That's a big change. Yeah, that, yeah. that is true. I mean, I think we're getting we're getting a little bit better, but you've nailed it. I mean, yeah. that is something that. We've we've gotten better over the last 20 years, right? Yeah. We still have a ways to go. Yeah. 
Um, you know, I spent a long time in uniform. And when I finally retired, um, <clears throat> I was in the reserves at that point because I was um, also in the agency. And you know, my retirement was a letter in the mail. You know, mm-hmm. there was no medical clearance or anything like that. And I don't want to talk about my situation, but you, I just highlight that. You know, that is that is awesome that you bring that focus and that attention because yeah. there's so many people who just don't want to talk about it. They, you know, yeah. either they're embarrassed or, you know, heaven forbid, the individuals who <clears throat> join because they wanted to serve something greater than themselves and they feel embarrassed and awkward about saying, I need help or I I want you know I could use these benefits either for myself or my children, and there's that hesitancy. So I think it's just fantastic for you to talk about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I uh, I put a big focus on like fellow veterans. Like you have to reach out to your fellow brothers and sisters. Yeah. You have to because the, the, yeah. the VA the VA is not doing it. They they can't keep track of anybody or everybody anyway. You know, the government can't keep track of every single veteran anyway. It's just too big of a machine, but yeah. we can. We can do stuff yeah. like this, and we mm-hmm. can call each other, and I can say, Dell, I don't know how to use this benefit, man. Do, what do you know? And the answer could be, I don't, but I know guys who do. That's yeah. that's it. That's We right. need to do more of this and not be afraid to do it because I've found, in my experience, calling on my fellow veterans has been judgment-free. Dude, mm-hmm. you don't know how to do that, bro? Yeah, I got yeah. you. Like, yeah. Hey, get you, let me get you some phone numbers. Call so and so. Go talk to so and so. Send me yeah. your resume. Just whatever it is, and then it turns into, dude, I'm so glad I made that call. And then that stigma of embarrassment is killed. It's dead. Mm-hmm. And then, then pay it forward. Yeah. Do it yeah. for the next guy you see getting out. Grab him by the collar and say, bro, come over here. What's the status? What's your resume look like? What's your job status look like? What's this? This and this. Start rattling off. Give them information overload. And they yeah. hand them your business card and say, bro, you call me if you need something. You know, I, that's, that's important, that's too. Yeah, it's like, um, you know, the, in the Army, they say, be all you can be. But it, it becomes all you are if you don't have a plan coming out. Uh, yeah. You can, you know, you can really get lost in the, uh, in the minutia of, uh, of life outside. That's such a great, um, that's such a great way of putting it as well, like, like, not knowing what to put on the next day, especially, you know, like, and it just like, as soon as you said that, it just reminded me of when I got out and I was just like, oh, wow, I don't put this on anymore. Yeah. And I, I didn't even have any civilian clothes really that I could like lean on. I had to literally go to a mall and get one of those little cards from like, I think it was like Sunpack or someplace like that and buy clothes. I didn't know what to wear. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. People don't think yeah. about it, but that's why we have like, uh, I think there's a salutes to suit where you can go and they yeah. they hook they get businesses that donate suits and you can go get a customs tailored suit. You know, a lot of veterans don't have a suit. You have service yeah. dress, you know, right. with all the stuff pinned on it. But I mean, you don't have a suit. Mm. That's a that's a real issue. That's yeah. true. And the reality is, it you know, if you're a service member, right, you can have your you know, you got your day to day, your ACUs, uh, DCUs, whatever they are, and then you've got your dress uniform, right? You only need one dress uniform because one, you don't wear it very often, but you know, if you do, that's the expectation is you're going to be wearing that. If yeah. you become, you know, train, make that transition into the business world, and you show up to the office every day with the same blue suit and the same white shirt and the same red tie. People are going to notice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look like a cartoon character. Yeah. You're opening yourself up for teasing. <laughs> like, bro, you only got one red tie. Yeah. Well, and even if you bought five of the same suit and five of the same tie, yeah. I mean, still going to get it. Yeah. To exactly. It. Oh, this is, exactly. this is number four. Oh, this, we're good. It's clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's fantastic. And, and it is very true that you have to engage your network, you have to engage your friends and your teammates because people don't ask for help for a lot of different reasons. It's hard. And each one of them has their own individual story and they got their own individual reason why they, you know, it's like, you know, maybe they just feel like they haven't earned it regardless of what they did. You know, they, you know, just are hesitant to do that because they know that other people paid an exponentially higher price. So, you know, I love the fact that you're you're talking about these things and advocating. That's fantastic. Yeah. Every day, every chance I can. 
Mm. Cool. Hey, you know, and I love the I love the fact that you took personal experience and what you what you saw, what you learned. And that's the key thing is what you learned and wanting to share it, because at the end of the day, if it dies with you, it, you know, it's loss. Um, but I love this and I have not read it cover to cover, I confess. But there is just some beautiful things in here, um, especially when you get to the end and you're you're talking about things like the importance of culture. Um, mm-hmm. how that is so critical to the health of an organization and the leadership, um, uh, the leadership uh, culture of, of an organization. You know, there's one quote you have here by uh, Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, it, it's like, and, yes. and we've all seen this, no matter how good the strategy is, if the culture is not so high, you know. Yeah. People yeah. hate coming to work. It doesn't matter what you have. Your strategy doesn't matter. Your, your ideas don't matter. It don't matter at all if people don't want to carry them out. I mean, we all know that. I mean, it's a it's an obvious thing. I don't think people say it enough, but it does. I mean, culture is so important. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's and I think that's one of the great things about this, because, again, it's, it's your experience. But it's more useful than, say, <clears throat> excuse me. The other 47 books out there that explain all the nuances of the OODA loop. <laughs> and I love the OODA loop, too. Right. <laughs> it, but I think we've beaten that horse to death. So getting the experience of an individual who's like, you know, who's done this is is fantastic. So uh, I love it. man. Um, you. Are you are you considering in any way um, like moving forward on this? Um, this aspect of your life? Are you looking into consulting or what are you what are what are you doing with this? You know, I for the longest time I wanted to do consulting and I just couldn't figure out how to really get into it or why I wanted to get into it. Um, I'd love to do it now. I'd love to do, you know, some professional speaking um, and, and sharing. I mean, I try to do podcasts like this all the time because I think it kind of is the same thing. Um I thought about writing a second book. I've thought about doing a second version. Um, The thing, the reason why the book came together like it did was because it organically happened. Um, I didn't have a deadline. Um, I had the contract and I had like 60,000 words written and I had the contract and I cut probably 45,000 of those words out, just dumped them right in the trash can. And I just organically sat there and, and worked away. Um, I got a, a downloaded app on my phone that just was a voice recorder and then it translated and I would just sit there for hours in my office at home and I would just talk about a topic and then I just started dumping it into a manuscript and, and refining it and that's how it so organically came about because at first it was a leadership book it was just preaching mm-hmm. about leadership and I said nobody wants to hear this there's a big there's a lot of big leadership books out there on the market and they're in the top five on Amazon for a reason. Uh, I'm not competing with that. I'm competing against nobody. I'm competing mm-hmm. against my own limitations. So that's mm-hmm. when it turned into more of a leadership memoir about my experiences. Mm-hmm. And then I wanted people to go away with something and not just have, hey, this guy about his experiences talking about certain topics. And that's when I built that leadership algorithm that I talk about in there and effort plus process. Uh, equals progress. And I thought that's perfect because it kind of sums up everything. And it's a, and an algorithm in a computer system is an infinite loop. You're always putting stuff in, there's mm-hmm. a process and you get progress and whatever that progress might be, it might be not the right output. It might be the wrong one. And then you start over. So I thought that's perfect for a leadership book. I can talk about my experiences. I can talk about this algorithm and associate it to things. And then people can walk away with something. And then if you open up the book to page 87, you can just Read about a topic, and then it can it's still applicable. You don't have to read it all the way through, and it just organically turned into that over like six months. And then when I turned it in, I was like, "That's it. I, I did it. That's it." Um, and I was good with it. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. No, oh, that's awesome. That's it's because really it, yeah. honestly, it's also you talk about these algorithm process. You know, it's not it's not dissimilar in any way from what we do at Greencastle with project management and change management and uh, process improvement. And I'm not trying to like sell you or recruit you to work for (laughs) Greencastle. Hey, I I follow you guys on Instagram, man, and you guys have a (laughs) heck of a culture. So sign me up for these professional development Fridays that I just saw (laughs) with the food and the briefing. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm all, 
<laughs> cool. Well, let's let's pivot a little bit and let's talk about you know your journey moving from writing nonfiction to writing fiction. Now you you had mentioned that <clears throat> you'd always wanted to write that you were always creative from the time you were uh, you know a young man. Um, you know, like I myself, you know, you're probably similar. To, like, love to read. Um, at what point did the spark ignite where you're like, you know what? I can do this. I've got a story to tell and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Um, I read Mike Madden's first uh, novel drone. And um, for the longest time, I hadn't been reading for pleasure. I was reading military books and I was studying for promotion, you know, doing school and all that. So I just, I hadn't read in a long time. Um, and we went to a bookstore. I saw Mike Madden's drone and the first edition just has the, the front of a predator drone on it and mm. that's it it's just very menacing and um i picked it up read it and i loved it and then i read all of mike's books i think he had three more after that in the drone series and that's when i was like you know one day i'm really gonna do it and then at that same time in my life um i was getting out and uh i had to have found success in the civilian world and leadership was a little bit more of my passion so I sat down. I just started writing both things. I started writing fiction and nonfiction, and I really wanted to get published in fiction. And I'm glad I didn't because that first manuscript was horrible. I mean, hell, <laughs> hell if I, I I wouldn't submit it to the critique group just because of the backlash I would get. Like it was just absolute garbage. But it was good that it was garbage because it uh, it put my focus on the nonfiction. So when I submitted to this publisher, um, I actually lived in the same city as their headquarters, and they we met at a brewery and we just sat there and talked because he was a uh, the CEO's or retired Green Beret, and we were just talking. and I told him about both books, and he said I want to see them both. I said, you know, they're not done. Uh, he said, well, I don't care. Send me what you got, and we'll go from there. Um, <clears throat> so I sent them both to him. Like three months later, he lets me know, hey, like them both. You're way stronger in the nonfiction. I feel like there's a more of a market for it now. And I was like, cool. So he said, let me know when you got it finished. And um, I kind of sat on it for a little bit. And then he called me out of the blue one day and said, how's the manuscript going? I said, man, I've only probably added like another 10,000 words. I just haven't been into it. And he said, send it to me anyway. Uh, he sent it back to me like a month later with a contract and said, I want you to finish it, get it done. And, and I want it. I'm going to buy it. So... <laughs> Ask. And we did it from there. And I just kind of held on to the novel ideas and continued to refine them. And then once I got the nonfiction turned into the publisher, uh, that's when I went to a couple of different conferences. Um, I started following more guys on social media that had done it before. I mm -hmm. uh, started a podcast. And I, then I just started saying I shifted in that direction and said, I got to be a student of the game now. So I picked up old Brad Thor books and old Clancy books and Jack Carr and and Greeny and I said, how how do these guys write this? How are they doing action? I just started becoming a student, and that's mm. when that's when it. I re, I've rewrote my fiction book five times now, and it's finally with an editor to to solidify it. And um, but it just it took a took time. It took that was kind of the process and and the journey to get to where I'm at today. That's really no, that, cool. That utterly resonates with me on multiple levels. Yes. Um, you know, you 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 bring up a, a point that I think is worth sharing with, with the whole of the uh, our audience, and that is um, service members. When you are in service, whether that's military or the agency or FBI, you're constantly in a process of professional development. Mm -hmm. Constantly, all you time. are you are a reading machine all the time and i would and and like you my friend i you know there was a period where i might get to read one or two books for pleasure a year in a given year um you know at, ironically being deployed you know in, in a war zone you actually got to read a little bit more because you know you're you know it's you need that decompression but yeah Service members reading all the time, professional development, huge part of our lives. We just don't get to read all that much. The other thing is that you you touch upon is the whole going through this process of recrafting and recrafting and recrafting yeah. that manuscript 
to get it. And it's an evolutionary process. And a lot of people will will knock out one manuscript and they're like, oh, it's garbage. I'll write another one. Um, and whether you do that route or you do what you did, that, you know, the focus, the determination to realize this dream, you know, to take this spark and turn it into an inferno um, just requires such dedication or such focus, commitment, yeah. follow through. Because, you know, I, I was having a conversation, I, I think it was with Don Bentley, it could have been with um, someone else, but, you know, it's not uncommon for somebody to not get published until they're hitting their fourth or fifth manuscript. Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's Very common. You're, you're reaching half a million words when you mm -hmm. get to that point. <laughs> um, so you've got, you know, and, and it's and it's what I really love about you is, you know, I think one t people will tend to write that first manuscript and like, oh, it doesn't go anywhere. So I'll write another one. And they write. Yeah. It takes a whole level of commitment that's utterly different to step back and say, OK, what I just put six, eight months into, I'm going to delete it all and redo it. So <laughs> mad yeah. props to you, brother. Thank you. Yeah. A lot yeah. of it, a lot of it, um, a lot of it, I, it was actually the, it was a, it was a good process because I had a story that, that wasn't good. It sucked, but I had pieces of that story that when I told people about it, they're like, that's cool. That's mm. cool. And then I gravitated towards some of the characters that I had developed. Um, and to the point where I fell in love with one of the characters so much that it gave me the direction to go in. I said, I'm going to flip this story around. This person is going to be the protagonist. This person is going to be the antagonist. I built the world. And it was like kind of like a process. So I was constantly pulling pieces and moving them around on like the chessboard kind of. Um, and if, if you know me, that's a horrible thing for me. I'm I'm scatterbrained. I like whiteboards. I like markers. I like organization. So trying to do all of this was just, yeah, you know, it just it absolutely just drove me insane. But once I refined it and got it down to where I wanted it, um, then it was all it was all games for. And I, I've probably wrote in the current story two hundred plus thousand words and and taken away and taken away and refined. Um, to get there. And I think I would tell that to anybody um, that's doing it. Like just because the delete button's there doesn't mean you should hit it. Maybe you should save it, use it for later. There's oh, something yeah. savory in there potentially. Oh yeah. And just because you write a manuscript that never sees the light of day does not mean you cannot cannibalize it when the need comes because Absolutely. If there's 100,000 words in there, I tell you what, there are five to 10,000 words that are pure gold. Oh, yeah. You just got to figure out when you're going to go back and get them. Yeah. Yeah. You got to go read it again. Notebooks. Yeah. I was going to say, I have 100 notebooks in my basement right now with just that in mind. A lot of times when I make notes and stuff, um, I'll just push down what I feel like uh, I could come back to, but I'll just write the notes above it. And then sometimes I'll go back down there in that manuscript and I'll look at those notes that I had before. And if I keep looking at it and it's like, um, you know what, this just doesn't match anymore. Then, I mean, then maybe I'll delete it. But otherwise, yeah, there's so much you can go back to so much you can cannibalize. And, you know, uh, I'm a process guy. I, I love to hear other writers process because it makes me feel like I'm not crazy. When I hear their ideas and way yeah. they do things, <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes you get in your head and, you know, um, but I liked how you were saying you were um, dictating into your device, um, yeah. just speaking into your device and then co going in and correcting uh, the text. And some people that might be listening to this um, as writers may not have considered that um, as a way of getting it out of their heads, because uh, even me, I'm I'm faster talking than I am typing. And sometimes if I'm typing, I might. By the time I get to the end of the sentence, I'm like, what was I writing? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. get lost in your head sometimes because you're so you're still thinking, you know, your yeah. brain is still clicking forward. And, you know, you you're. Ten scenes ahead before by the time you're, you're trying to dictate what's going on. So it's nice to hear that uh, as a process. And, and, you know, one of the things you you kind of mentioned about moving the moving the pieces on the board and changing, mm -hmm. and readapting and, you know, oh, no, this is going to be my protagonist. You know, uh, uh, Taylor Moore uh, writes the Garrett Cole uh, series. Garrett Cole was originally like a secondary or tertiary character in one of his older manuscripts. And now he's he's 
off cooking with uh, cooking with uh, Crisco. Um, <laughs> I guess young people don't say that anymore. That makes me old timey when I say stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hey, you know, there's something else that you had mentioned that I think, um, you know, it's utterly essential for writers, especially if you want to break in. But it's not simply for writers. It's for any artist. It's for any entrepreneur. It's for any business person. And that is the criticality of networking, right? Getting out there. You know, you're making the investment and learning more. You're trying to learn more about this industry. You're adapting constantly. You're gathering information. You're constantly adapting your craft or finding your craft, but also adapting the direction you're going. But you can't overstate, you know, the importance of networking. You know, for example, you know, why do we remember Paul Revere and not William Dawes? Because yeah. Paul Revere had a much better, like, you know, interpersonal professional network than William Dawes did. William Dawes actually got to Lexington before Paul Revere. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you talk a little bit about, like, not only your perspective on that in terms of why it's so important or what you're doing? Because you are out there and you're connected. You're connect, connected with Jeff Circle and the Dossier. Um, I know you, you're in contact with, uh, in contact with Ryan Stack. You know, you're doing some really, really awesome stuff. So mm -hmm. why can you tell us a little bit about that? So, um, yeah, networking is important. Um, I think it's asking for people's time unconditionally, kind of saying, hey, I, I want your time to talk about you. And a byproduct of that is learning a little something on myself. Um, so I, I think if you're going to ask something of people, you have to be willing to give something equally, if not mm -hmm. more so. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't ask for books. People send them to me. I've never asked for an advanced copy. If somebody's put something out there, like, hey, brother, I'll take one and advertise for you. But if you don't have one, you don't have one. I'm good. Give them, give them out to real readers first. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then if you got leftovers, think of me. If not, don't worry about it. People send me books. Publicists send me books because I've just built that rapport with them. And I've said, I want to have Don Bentley on the show. I want to have your debut author on the show because uh, I'm not doing it for clicks and likes. I'm doing it to promote other people. So I don't care what the analytics look like. Um, I'm doing it for someone else. So I care what it looks like for them. I don't care about my own popularity. Um, my popularity and my following will come because of I'm doing things with true intentions that integrity that good intent is there so yeah. um I've made a lot of friends with people just because of that of having the conversations like this doing an Instagram live with somebody randomly uh and just showing that genuine stuff like I don't need anything from you you don't have to send me anything this is not a fee um, this is me doing it because I want to talk about books. I want to talk about the military, veterans issues, whatever it may be. And I've, I've built, I've built kind of a following in a community and, um, and part of it is practice what you preach. You know, I tell yeah. veterans all the time, build your community. And if, well, if I'm not doing it, then what does that look like? So, um, I've tried to make genuine connections. I've tried to work with people, uh, pick their brains, promote for them, um, there'll be a day where I'll, I'll ask for it from them, I'm sure in return. And I'll have those things in my pocket to cash in on. Mm -hmm. Um, but for now it's like, um, and, and part of it also is like Adela, you know, this at the end of the day, if we don't get published, we're still fans. I still get it. Everything yeah. I'm doing right now yeah, still allows me to be a fan. So nothing changes if I never publish another book again, nothing yeah. changes. Everything I've built stays exactly the same. So, I don't I have an investment in it, but at the same time, not one that's going to cripple me. You know, yeah. I want to tell stories, but I also like enjoying hearing about stories. So I know Kyle Mills um, and, you know, I got some of these phone numbers and and I don't call and bug them all the time. But, um, you know, when I need something, I have I have references and it's just you build a genuine relationship with people and you don't hound them about things. Mm -hmm. Some guys go to book signings and they they find the agent at the book signing. And say, hey, you want to read my manuscript? No, they don't want to read your manuscript. You're they're there for their author, not yeah, not yeah. to hear you. So you build a genuine relationship with them, and then later on, it's like, hey, do you mind looking at this for me and, and tell me if I'm on the right path? And then they're more open to do that <laughs> because you were a good dude to them in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And you wanted them right. for them. Yeah, right. I, 
I cannot tell you how you utterly nailed it on the head because, yeah. you know, it is it's a delicate dance and there are there are acceptable norms within within the community. Um, you know, there are things you you should do. There are things that you should absolutely not do. <laughs> and and you nail yeah. a couple of them. Um, yeah. and, and, it, and it's and it's something that's like not necessarily something that you would know like you know you don't bug people and ask them hey can i be on your podcast they will they will reach out to you i mean but there's yeah. there's all kinds of other other things and you know it's fantastic that you're you're doing this how did you yeah. did you get to know jeff circle at like voucher con or something i uh, know i mean jeff have actually never met but um uh, okay he, uh, I just followed him on the dossier and started seeing some of the stuff that he was doing. And then when he did the uh, what's that watch list thing that he just recently did, Dell, that me and you both did. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, the, uh, the watch list or whatever watch- it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw him advertise that, and I think I was like the first person to reply back to him, and was like, "I'll do it, I'll do it." And then from there, it just turned into like, "Hey, what if?" What if I we kind of helped each other out? And what if like if I hear about authors who are looking for opportunities, I send them your way. And in return, um, if I have leftover dossier questions that don't fit in the dossier, I'll punt it to you and you can ask mm-hmm. it on mm-hmm. the show. So I said, perfect. Cool. A little segment across promotion. And I said, sure, why not? Um, so it was just kind of a natural talking on Twitter kind of thing. And, and that's how me and Jeff kind of settled on it. No, he is. A, he is a good dude. Um, I've never met him either. Um, but, you know, excellent dude. And I love what he's doing there because, again, it's it's this really, really cool community that, you know, you would you you show up to like Thriller Fest and you're like, you know, this guy's never going to talk to me, you know, and, you know, they will. We'll engage you in conversation. Oh yeah, um, I met Andrews and Wilson. I had him on the podcast twice, and then I ran into him at Thriller Fest. And I thought, man, nobody's going to recognize me here. Like I'm a, I'm not even a rookie. I'm a wannabe, you know. And uh, yeah, Brian, Brian walked right up to me, brother. How's it going? How are you doing, man? And I was like, I'm good. Like, like what are you doing? He's like, I got to go over to Blackstone here, and he was dressed up in a polo and a nice shirt and was looking all good. He's like, I got to do an interview here, an interview there. I'm just talking like this, and and then uh, Kyle Mills at BoucherCon. I mean, every night I sat there and drank beers with him, and he just told me his life story. Like, <laughs> we were best friends, and it's like, so good. it's just genuine. <laughs> so it's it's it was really cool. I I heard I heard about his first manuscript, which was really cool that landed in Clancy's lap, and how embarrassed he was. <laughs> oh wow, yeah, that's great. Um, hey, do you well, have kids? I do. I have four. Sweet mother of four kids. Wow. wow. Yeah. My <laughs> oldest is uh, he's working on helicopters at Moody Air Force Base in Georgia right now. He's an avionics oh, nerd. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> awesome. That's I love. I love to see. I love to see that family connection. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. That is very cool. Um, I will. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put a pitch in for uh, my friend Jeff here. So I've had the opportunity to look at some of his stuff and um, I, I know you've got it in editing right now. But, man, when that gets out there, it's going to be it's going to be very, very cool. Well, thank very, you. Very, very cool. Um, fiction work. Yeah. 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 Fiction work. Yeah. 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 I've, I've yeah, recently I'd shared it with a, I've recently shared it with a couple of people. Um, with some pretty good standing in the industry, and I got way better feedback than I thought I was going to. Um, some technical things to work on, you know, learning kind of those things that editor that acquiring editors want to see. Um, mm-hmm. Fixable stuff, though. So it was like real, real reassuring that I was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing something correct. Mm. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That's good and validating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw an earlier version of it and, um, you know, it hooked me. It was just a, like an awesome idea. And I love the way you write and the visualizations. Um, you, know, you, you got talent, brother. You Thank know, you. So keep, keep at it. You're going to do you're going to do great things. Appreciate um, it's inspiring, especially because uh, as a writer and the people that are watching this right now that are writers or wanting to be writers, um, I think it's encouraging to hear, um, like we say, the process and uh, the. Uh, the journey 
uh, yeah. because it's it is uh, it's a hell of a journey, especially um, when you're um, trying to figure out your voice uh, as a writer. And and yeah. sometimes you don't know what that is until you get into that fourth manuscript. You know, you might well, not yeah. even you get write. the you become yeah. a writer by writing. Like I exactly write, I've wrote so much stuff over and over and over again. <clears throat> it, I wanted to write like Brad Thor because I love the way Brad is quick. He's fast. Um the action is there. I wanted to write like Brad and I tried really hard to write like Brad and it just never felt that organic. And then I kind of switched it up and then I read uh, Mark Greeny's Sierra six and I saw the way he pieced together certain things. And I said, what if I did that instead of trying to tell a story from one single third person POV, what if you told it from multiple kind of third person POVs so that you're getting this big top down, Mm -hmm look at the whole world and that's what greeny does so well and uh when i switched it up and started doing that and i just said i'm not gonna go with the standard template i'm just gonna write and piece things together where i want them to go i'm not gonna pay attention to word count paragraph count or anything like that i'm just gonna do it and i just started writing and writing and writing that's when i found my voice because i kind of figured out how i wanted to be told yeah Mm, that's really good that's really good thank you for that yeah it's uh I've, I'm finding myself as a nonlinear writer for the most part. When a scene hits me, um, I just write that scene. You know, yeah. I don't think about where it's going to go, how it's going to connect. I figure it'll puzzle itself in eventually. But if I write, if I don't write it, the scene might go away. I may not have it, or I may not have the option to, or even think about it again. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting finding your style, your technique, and your voice. Um, all through this whole process. And um, I like also what you said about networking um, and networking and making sure you have those connections around you because, uh, and also making sure that you're networking in the right way so that you're coming at people with integrity and uh, you're coming at people with, um, you know, uh, 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 an amount of respect because people will remember you either because you showed that kind of respect or that you made it weird. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's true <So. laughs> I, I i've always been a firm believer that if you're going to ask something of someone you got to be able to give something in return for sure yeah. and if you're going to ask somebody for something like don't 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 make that your first you know, your first line yeah like, hey man i'm so and so you read my manuscript oh, i don't even know you <laughs> like <laughs> exactly uh, you know you already want something from me like people just yeah don't like that necessarily, especially agents and editors who do it for a living. And they get thousands of those things. The last thing they want to hear from somebody brand new is, hey, will you read my stuff? I'm looking for a deal. Yeah, Yeah. that's like a wall that shuts right up as soon as you say that. Yeah. Yeah, So be genuine, get to know them. And maybe you you might get to know them and realize that you're not a good fit for them anyway. So Mm. then you just don't waste each other's time and you don't ever put a bad taste in anybody's mouth. But yeah. they might think of you someday and go, hey, you know, I heard so-and-so is working on a project like this. It's not for me, but you should hit them up. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're getting a phone call. Mm. Oh, absolutely. That's great stuff. So we are uh, we're kind of getting to the end of uh, our time. Um, yeah. So, Brother Jeff, <clears throat> if you had like just 30 seconds and there was something you wanted to you know, tell the veteran community, what would it be? Uh, ask for help. Reach ask out. Help. Reach out and ask for help. You'd be shocked at the amount of people that are willing to give their time, their efforts, their money, their advice, their everything to help you out. So do not, and there are no circumstances, assume the answer is no until you hear it first. Okay. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Two more questions. Because I'm like that. <laughs> like a pop quiz. You don't know what's coming. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> so for somebody who wants to write, somebody who wants to create, whether maybe it's writing, maybe it's painting, maybe it's music, whatever it is, what would you tell them? Be a student first. Mm-hmm. Study. Look at the people who have done it before you and ask questions. Even if you're just watching YouTube, hey, what piece of equipment did he use? What is he what is he talking about here? What's the tempo of you know beats per minute? What's the page count? What is the you know philosophy? Just and start openly asking questions and then maybe you know slide into their DMs, send them an email, you know, and just kind of go from there and and be a student. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. And the one last question, because I ask this of every author who comes on board. 
who's 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 your favorite James Bond? And I'm not saying that there's a right answer, but there is some answers that are righter than others. <laughs> uh, I mean, I I don't think you can really go wrong with Connery. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I love him. I thought Pierce Brosnan did a good, really good job, and I and I like Daniel Craig. I really do. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I it's like them all. I really well, do. That, that is a very good actor. Uh, <laughs> hey, brother. Um, hey, thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you, uh, guys. I know you were a busy yeah. dude between, you know, your day job and writing and the podcasting and all the amazing yeah. things you're doing. But thank you for taking the time to come on and, and talk about your experience and your path. Yeah, appreciate uh, um, you guys. Yo, and, and you know. I, I, you're an inspiration to uh, you know to fellow writers and and Al and myself, but also to to fellow veterans. You know, hey, oh, there you. is there is something next for you. Yeah, you just got got to work at it. Yeah, cool. yeah absolutely. Hey, uh, humans, yeah. thank you for joining us. If you have not gotten yourself a copy of Jeff Clark's "Hear These Truths," you need to check it out. It's uh, it's really good. It's really good. Really impactful. Yeah. Well, I'll send it off. Thank you, everyone, for watching today's podcast episode with uh, Jeff Clark. Um, make sure you guys like and subscribe, too, because we put out great content like this. And put some comments down. Let us know what type of content you're looking for, too, because we're, we're always just happy to be able to provide good, uh, good feedback, good content uh, to the public like this. So have a great day. See you in the next episode.